Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, virtual meeting. Uh, I hope you are well and safe in the midst of the challenging global events that we are all facing. My name is Petra Tanos. I'm the head of strategic partnerships for the Tropical Forest Alliance. And we are really delighted to welcome you today. Uh, before uh, we get started, I just wanted to provide a quick introduction to this uh, virtual meeting, especially for those who are joining for the first time. The Jurisdictional Exchange Network is an informal community of practice convened by the Tropical Forest Alliance of those uh, organizations and individuals that are working to advance jurisdictional approaches or landscape approaches to tackling commodity-driven deforestation. We began these series of virtual meetings at the end of last year, very much in response to an ask from our partners to provide a platform for uh, exchange uh, of best practice, uh, a space to help everyone stay connected and informed about some of the latest developments in this very quickly uh, evolving space. Um, before I hand over to ICEL, who will be leading the discussion today, I wanted to just uh, voice some quick housekeeping rules. Um, you will see on the Zoom toolbar that these housekeeping rules have been posted in the chat function. If you have any technical issues, you've got an email address that you can reach out to. The, the microphone and video for our participants will be turned off, but there is absolutely an opportunity to ask questions through the Q&A function. Um, and uh, you can feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, there will be an official Q&A section at the end where we will be highlighting some specific questions uh, that we get through the Q&A. And then as a final note, uh, we are recording this uh, meeting and the recording will be available after the call for you to review and share with your colleagues. Um, with that, I would like to hand it over to Patrick Mallet from ICL2 to take us through uh, today's meeting. Thank you, Patrick. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Patra. And uh, welcome everyone, I appreciate you taking the time to join us. And we've got a, a number of uh, great speakers coming in during this session. So. Uh, hopefully, we'll keep it lively for you. Um, just one slide on ICL for those of you who don't know. ICL is the uh, Global Association of Credible Sustainability Standards. Many of those logos you probably recognize. Um, some of them have been around for a long time. And, uh, and essentially, ICL seeks to support all of those sustainability standards and similar tools to become more effective. So you might be thinking if uh, if we're focused on sustainability standards, why are we consulting on guidance on jurisdictional verification and claims? It's actually not that much of a stretch. So if you imagine sustainability standards are trying to uh, bring about systemic change, either at a sectoral level, ge geographic level, um, trying to really drive um, durable change, then what they are trying to do is figure out how to do that at a broader scale. And so the guidance itself is one way that we're helping to open the conversation about how do we monitor, verify, and communicate progress at scale. Um, and the other thing that we know is that verification at a production unit level works reasonably well, but how can we be more efficient and see how that same type of verification can apply at scale. Um, and so when we started looking at jurisdictional approaches, there's a lot of different experiments happening, a lot of uh, new initiatives, and we'll talk about some of those. We've got representatives from some of those initiatives, uh, all trying to figure out what are the best practices. And we identified ICL identified a contribution that we can make to this conversation, which is to look at the types of claims that jurisdictions and the companies or financial institutions that support those jurisdictional initiatives want to make about progress that's happening in the jurisdiction. Uh, and I do want to put a, a shout out to GIZ, which uh, has been funding our work in this area, which we really appreciate. Um, so, as I mentioned, there's a, a wide range of these jurisdictional frameworks, um, a, a number of initiatives working on the ground to 
uh, either work with governments like LTKL, who's uh, on the call today, um, looking at how they can uh, initiate some of these practical collaborations on the ground, as well as a number of uh, frameworks that are being developed. And, and also on the call, we've got uh, representatives from Landscale, Reinforced Alliance, and Verified Sourcing Areas, IDH. Um, so we'll hear from them later. But basically, it's a, you know, it's a busy landscape. And so within that, we wanted to see how we could best uh, support and ensure that these initiatives are credible and are actually driving practical improvements on the ground. Um, so when we looked at how best to come at this uh, piece of work, it was clear that the way that most stakeholders relate to jurisdictions, jurisdictional initiatives, is through what's the end use, what are, why are they engaging in a process? And so we try to capture that under a claims rubric, but really this is about what do we want to say about what we're doing on the ground and what do we need to have in place to underpin that so that it's, uh, so that what we're saying is credible and has a strong foundation. And so essentially this is about exploring monitoring and verification practices that should be in place to underpin credible claims. And you can see those arrows along the bottom of the slide are essentially the, the steps in a process that a jurisdictional initiative more or less would go through. So it's, and we'll get into these in more detail, but it's first about how do you support uh, development of the process? Then obviously, how do you implement activities and see improvement on the ground? But how can you measure that through the monitoring um, and verification or authentication of that monitoring, all of which underpins credible claims and communication. And so just before we get to our first set of uh, speakers, I want to start to provide some context for what constitutes credible claims. And for any of you who have a, a, a knowledge of ICL's past work, maybe you recognize some of these either from our credibility principles uh, or from our work on good practices in claims, or challenge the label on campaigns like that. Um, but we've tailored these especially for uh, jurisdictional claims. And so if you think about what are the values that would underpin credible claims, it's things like truthfulness and relevance. So are you addressing the, the most important issues? Are the claims proportional? That's one that's really important when we're talking about the improvement context. Um, how can you ensure that what you're saying doesn't overstate the benefits that uh, have been achieved or the results that have been achieved? Um, and then transparency is kind of tied to truthfulness. Uh, but is about making, in this case, the data clearly accessible and available. Um, and finally, robustness um, is about the monitoring and verification. It's, it's what underpins the quality of the claim. And so the way that we structure the good practice guide, and I should say, this good practice guide, it is out for consultation right now, and it is very much almost primarily our intention is to put out some ideas as a starting point for conversation, as a way to kickstart the conversation about what should we be looking for, what types of monitoring and verification are useful. Um, and so when we approach this, these are all just starting point ideas that you should all feel comfortable and welcome to uh, criticize, to um, uh, find holes or gaps or ways of improving the proposals that we've been making. And in that structure, again, we structure it around claims and we go into three different types of claims. We recognize that there is in fact, uh, because these are long-term processes, there's value in the process itself, in the setting up and planning stages. So how do we recognize the commitments that jurisdictions have made or that companies that are supporting those processes have made? Um, and then more directly, those companies or financing institutions 
who are supporting the jurisdictions want to be able to say things about what they're doing or uh, how they're supporting. So those are the supporting action claims. And then the core substance of this uh, document is really around performance because that's, you know, that's where we're seeing the change on the ground. How do you communicate changes in practices? How do you communicate improvement? Um, what types of systems need to be in place? So that's the basic structure and we'll come back to that in the, the next part of the conversation. But first, I wanna engage all of you because um, I know it's uh, a lot more interesting if you're not just listening to all of us. Uh, so we've got a quick poll, um, which should come up on your screen now. There you go, we'll just give you a minute. I am most interested to see or be able to make claims about, please choose one of the following. And we'll share the results. Just a minute. This is great. I can't see who's actually answering the poll or not. So hopefully all of you have by now, but uh, uh, Gianluca on the back end is, uh, is mastering the, the polls. Okay, so there we go. Uh, most people interested to see, well, it's pretty close, a good split. Um, progress, so this is interesting. Making claims about progress in developing a jurisdictional initiative. Hopefully you all read that closely enough. That's really about the development process. So getting the stakeholders together, um, building a land use plan, uh, having indicators and targets, what you're trying to achieve and plans for getting there. So that's really the first stage in the process, which a lot of jurisdictional initiatives, that's where they currently are. Um, but performance improvements on the ground at 50%. So those are the changes happening once the system is operational. Um, and I, I'm, I have to say I'm a bit surprised. I would have thought that a lot of people wanted to make statements about what are the actual changes on the ground. So maybe we can get into that in the question period. Um, so if we close that, we can now go to the first couple of speakers and I'm actually gonna first pass it back to Petra uh, to speak a little bit from the TFA perspective why this uh, work on verification and monitoring and claims is relevant. Great, thanks Patrick. And, uh, and in fact, I did just wanna offer a few comments to help frame this discussion of as many of you are aware, the ambition of the TFA when it comes to jurisdictional and landscape approaches is to mobilize private sector engagement um, in initiatives at landscape or jurisdictional scale and to support the enabling conditions for this engagement to happen. And, and that's part of what, this, uh, what we're talking about today is all about. Um, companies along the supply chain have and are continuing to increase their engagement in landscapes and are beginning to work at jurisdictional scale in collaboration with other stakeholders. And this engagement can come in many forms, um, whether uh, supporting specific projects in a landscape, um, engaging more directly in the governance or design of uh, a, a jurisdictional scale effort um, or program. And the motivation for these kinds of engagement is often linked uh, in the case of uh, what we're talking about today, which is forest risk commodities. It's often linked to uh, um, zero deforestation commitments companies may have made managing risks in their supply chain. And in many cases also um, more traditional CSR efforts uh, to support community development, livelihoods, smallholders and positive environmental outcomes. Um, and we know that transformation at landscape scale happens on a long time horizon. Uh, it takes often years to realize the concrete impacts uh, like reduced, uh, reduced deforestation or improved livelihoods. And this requires a sustained engagement and support by companies and other stakeholders. And this is just one of many reasons why it is so critical for companies to be able to articulate in concrete terms what their engagement is in a credible way at every stage of that journey, not just at the end, 
when impact happens. Um, companies really need to be able to uh, uh, speak both internally to get buy-in and support for investing these, uh, in these initiatives and externally to stakeholders who want to better understand what actions are companies taking. And um, building alignment uh, and, and aligning the community on the good practice around uh, verification and claims is really, um, it's of paramount importance because it's the only way to ensure that claims that companies make are credible. Um, and, and it's really the only way to be able to credibly demonstrate that impact of jurisdictional approaches overall. Uh, and so that um, hopefully just kind of sets the context for why this, uh, this work is, is so important and why we uh, are um, supporting ICL and our partners working on this issue in sharing this with the broader community. Um, so that's all from my side. Excellent, Patrick. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It's uh, nice to set that context. We almost could have had that right off the top. Um, to, for a, a grounded perspective, I want to bring in Rustika now. Um, LTKL, she'll introduce the organization for those of you who don't know, but essentially it's a, a collaboration of district level governments in Indonesia doing amazing work uh, on trying to get better, a better sense of uh, um, progress on the ground in those jurisdictions. So Ristika, I'll hand it to you. Okay, thank you, Patrick, for your introductions. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening from Indonesia. I'm Ristika. Uh, recently, I work to manage data and knowledge in Secretariat LTKL. So for your information, LTKL is a district uh, government association that focusing on the towards sustainable land use uh, with the collective action in Indonesia. So today I want to share with you uh, based on our experiences actually uh, about the challenges, the proposed solution, and also how the ICL guideline can make our journey easier, something like that. So let's start with the challenges. Uh, today's discussion is very re relevant with, uh, with our challenge, like how to keep a uh, progressive district uh, motivated to pursue sustainable land use. Because this is not short uh, time process, but this is the long time process. Uh, so uh, we try to uh, trying to help the district, like what possible incentives are available to keep the district motivated. And also how uh, the district can get uh, the, the incentive about uh, their progress, something like that. So recently, LTKL uh, have one proposed solution uh, for one for it, which is regional competitiveness framework that we are developing. Uh, so the regional competitive framework is the summarized based on the performance uh, uh, expect from the district. So we summarize based on uh, the market initiative, uh, market based frameworks, and also the compliance from the national level to look at what are the performance to get it the incentive. So we find out like uh, the key performance to get incentive. The first one is the ecosystem protection. And the second one is the fire prevention. And the last one is about the community uh, right, including the indigenous and also livelihood. So instead of that, uh, we try to help the district also to uh, measure and also uh, to report the progress Maybe I can give your imagination like, for example, like the district can show the progress about the fire prevention and they can report about it, uh, but they don't have, uh, they, they uh, don't get any incentive about that. So what then about that? That's why we are collaborating with the partners like TFA and now with the ICL, we are discussing a lot about it. And because we are looking that ICL help the private sector to better understand uh, their role to support the jurisdiction. Maybe, uh, for example, I'm looking in the guidelines specific on the supporting action claim sections, because in this uh, section, this guideline provides specific actions uh, for the company to support the jurisdiction, including um, like funding, in-kind support, or also preferential sourcing. So when they have already clear about the, already have the understanding on their role, so it makes easier for us to uh, figure out what types of the incentive. So it can be aligned to with our timeline. 
maybe for example, maybe uh, let's say uh, you already uh, see our background, <laughs> my background, it is Siak district. So let's say this is the district Siak. Uh, the district Siak uh, by year one uh, already issue the green Siak roadmap. And it's also aligned with the company commitment uh, on the sustainability. So the company can also help the district to give the technical assistance to implement the green uh, SIAC roadmap as uh, in-kind support, something like that. Or another example, like by year three, uh, uh, the district already have the good database on small order, something like that. And it's also helped the companies uh, to uh, help them uh, about the legality issue. So the company uh, or the private sector can also help the district uh, to uh, give additional funding maybe to make more small holder to improve the database. So all of uh, my explanation or my example is our hope because uh, we ensure that sustainable land use can possibly happen because the district cannot work alone and the private sector cannot work alone too. So we hope that the ICL guideline can help us to ensure that the incentive on the sustainable land use can possibly happen. So yeah, that's all uh, Patrick for our for my explanation. So thank you. Rastika, thank you so much. That uh, was really valuable. I think just, you know, from a number of perspectives, the incentives piece I think is so critical. Um, and when we think about how change happens, this is very much about partnerships. It's about uh, bringing together um, jurisdictions that are interested to make change that have the right incentives and drive and whether that's a competitiveness piece or, um, uh, or peer pressure or, or having good support from companies, all of those things I think are necessary to drive that kind of change. Um, so thanks and we can come back. Hopefully folks have questions for Rustika at, uh, at the end of our session. Thank so let's, uh, let's, yeah, thanks. Let's dive into the, uh, the guidance itself. Um, so you'll remember just before we had the speakers, um, there are three stages or three steps in the, the jurisdictional claims guidance. The first one about process development, then about supporting actions and, and finally measuring performance. So I'm just going to talk a couple of slides about each of those three sections, just to give you some of the highlights uh, from what we're proposing. And again, just to reiterate, this is very much guidance that is a starting point for discussion. This is not something that's fully baked. It's not something that we have a lot of experience on the ground yet with. So if you have experiences to share, please do that in the, in the question and answer session or even after this webinar. So first of all, elements of an effective process. If we think about um, what are the steps or the pieces that need to be in place, not every jurisdiction is going to go down a similar pathway or do things in a similar order, but in general, there are three core pieces. There is the governance piece, which is about bringing people together. It's about putting the structures in place to give people a voice to talk about um, what the future of that jurisdiction looks like in a more coordinated way. And coming out of that is the planning process that the development of the work plan and the progress framework, um, sometimes more formalized than others, but essentially the, um, the framing for how the jurisdiction will move forward. Also within that are the goals and targets that uh, the jurisdiction is trying to achieve. And then one where a lot of jurisdictions are only just starting to think about how to do this, although I have to say LTKL has done really well already to access and, and make use of data that exists about progress in the jurisdictions. But it's, it's the monitoring piece. It's the piece about um, how do you understand whether the work that you're doing is actually driving change on the ground? Um, and how can you be sure that the data that you have is credible? So that's where we'll get to verification. Um, as I said, the guidance is structured around a series of claims. These are just two of a, a range of claims that we include under the first section on, on process. Um, and what we try to do is suggest a number of prerequisites that would need to inform or be in place for each of these types of claims. So the most obvious one is 
uh, as a company, we're supporting the development of a jurisdictional initiative, or as a jurisdiction or as a jurisdictional stakeholder, we're participating in a jurisdictional initiative. It's a fairly low bar in terms of a claim, um, and we're suggesting that the governance elements of that jurisdictional initiative should be in place. If you wanted to talk about, this is language that uh, IDH has previously batted around. I don't know if we'll continue down this, this type of claim, but if you want to say you're a committed sourcing area, so you're a jurisdiction that is on a path to improvement, then maybe you need to have a bit more in place, the governance, the planning, the monitoring framework. Uh, but there are a number of other types of claims around the process. And what we're most interested in is understanding what are some of the claims that you as stakeholders want to make about jurisdictional initiatives. The second type, the one that Ristika is particularly interested in, uh, is around the range of supporting actions. And here, this is primarily from the perspective of companies that want to source from these jurisdictions, but also financial institutions that may uh, be able to provide financial support um, on better terms. So the most obvious uh, and straightforward is funding, but that can be for specific actions in a landscape or for the entire jurisdictional initiative. So you could fund the process itself, recognizing that this is often, as Petra said, quite a, a long and engaged process of development. Um, and specific actions, this is almost more traditionally if a company engages in a jurisdiction, they'll financially support capacity building, for example. But then there's a lot of in-kind support that they can also offer, whether that's expertise or uh, communication support, uh, support on monitoring and, and verification. Um, and finally, preferential sourcing is again, just more about the business relationship between the companies and the jurisdictions or the enterprises within the jurisdictions, whether that's sourcing contracts or better terms, things like that. And so when we get into the claims, I think the, the core piece to think about here is if you're a company sourcing from a jurisdiction, how can, you can very easily make a claim about what are the things that you have done in that jurisdiction, the specific contribution. But if you wanted to say, as a result of our contribution, this change has happened, this decrease in deforestation has happened as a result of what we did, that's called attribution because you're attributing that result to your actions. And that's a lot more complicated to say, to make that direct relationship or connection. Um, if you're a committed sourcing company, again, language that we may or may not see in the future, we can, we can ask Ido later in our uh, webinar. Uh, but if you're a committed sourcing company, how much action do you have to take? And here we get into interesting questions, very open questions about, you know, how big an investment do you need to make? How big is that compared to your overall, uh, the size of your enterprise or the, the level of sourcing that you have from that region? Um, and over what time scale? You know, is this a one-off thing or as a committed sourcing company, do you have to engage year on year with a jurisdiction? Um, and these are all very subjective and gray areas, but at least it's interesting to put out the the questions as a basis for discussion. Because ultimately, as a community, what we're trying to do here is build alignment about what we think is credible and needs to be in place. So then the third piece, and this really is, as I mentioned, the, the core of the guidance, um, and I think the most important part of the jurisdictional initiatives is the, the implementation. How do we measure and communicate progress and change that's happening on the ground. So what a number of jurisdictional initiatives are looking at is how can you monitor progress? So monitoring in very simple terms is data collection about performance. And then you're thinking, okay, well, why, does, why do we need verification as well? Well, so verification is about ensuring or assessing the integrity of that data. So we wanna, not only do we wanna have the data about performance, 
but we want to make sure that it is actually meaningful and representative of what's happening on the ground. So within the monitoring piece, there's, there's a number of different things that uh, a jurisdictional initiative or whoever's in, responsible for the monitoring would do around choosing metrics, um, having, choosing which data sources. You know, often what we're seeing is jurisdictions will look at what data sources exist, what are governments producing, what are academic institutions producing, and how relevant is that data for what they're trying to measure, as opposed to going out and saying, okay, well, what is it exactly that we'd like to measure? Does that data exist already? If it doesn't, how else would we get it? And looking at primary data collection. Um, and then on the verification side, it's very much about what do you verify? So really, this is about verifying the quality and relevance of the data. And how do you do that and how much? Because we don't want to overburden these systems. We want to try and find that sweet spot where we're really just checking information and data to ensure its integrity without going into the same kinds of intensive verification practices that we see in a lot of certification programs. So just to give you one example, because um, there's a number of different sets of good practice guidance within the monitoring piece, this is about some of the things you would look for in the quality or to ensure the quality of the monitoring data. Um, and I won't go through these one by one, but it's more just to give you a sense of um, when you're looking at data sources, what are the types of things that would help to give you confidence in the quality of that data? Um, particularly things like, is, is it, does the data have good coverage? Is it complete? Um, is it timely? Does it come every, uh, every year or uh, at least at time intervals that you can say, well, this is relevant for um, current practice and not indicative of something that happened five years ago. Um, so you can spend more time with, with this list and other lists, because I'm sure all of you will be uh, eager to review the guidance um, after this webinar, if you haven't already. And so just one final slide for me. Um, when you get to claims about performance, there are very concrete uh, claims about the change that has happened. Um, and just one example of that are improvement claims. We have done something that is so much better than what happened before. In this case, reduced our water consumption by 50% relative to the baseline or relative to the target that we're trying to achieve. Um, and the key things here are having that reference performance level um, as well as a time frame. Um, but so that's kind of the easy stuff, comparatively easy. You know, you still have um, a lot of experimenting to do as to what you can and can't say. Uh, but when we start to think about ultimately what do companies and jurisdictions want to say about their performance, there are these questions of, well, can you say you're a responsible jurisdiction or a responsible sourcing company? or ultimately uh, we're sustainable. We've done all this work and as a result, we consider uh, this jurisdiction to be sustainable. Uh, and obviously these are subjective words and this is where almost more than anywhere else, it's interesting to have a conversation about our expectations of should companies or jurisdictions be able to say they're acting responsibly or they're sustainable? And if so, what needs to be in place? What kinds of progress need to have been achieved? Um, so I think with that, I'm gonna take us to our second poll. Um, yeah, we'll bring the poll up now, there we go. What values are most important for the effective implementation of jurisdictional initiatives? So we give you four options there. And just like last time, we'll just give you another 30 seconds to choose an answer.
Okay, here we go. Uh, the values most important, locally adapted approaches and transparency of information and data. Interesting. So the locally adapted approaches, I think is, it, that's something I'd love to explore, particularly if anybody has uh, thoughts or questions about it, because what's so important about these initiatives is that they do reflect the reality on the ground. But when we look at how can you communicate progress, there's a lot of uh, companies and uh, NGOs and other stakeholders, financial institutions that want to have some comparability between systems, between jurisdictions. Um, and if we're all, for example, taking different actions or measuring different things, it makes that comparability a lot more difficult. But at the same time, we do that for a reason, and that's because it's important that stakeholders buy into a locally derived process. So maybe we can dive into that a little bit more. But right now, just before we go to the Q&A, and please do put your questions into the question box, we've got two more speakers. Um, I'm going to pass it first to Guido from IDH, who we've worked with closely as the manager of the verified sourcing areas. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. All right, great. Um, no, thanks a lot. Uh, so th this work is actually uh, extremely relevant for our work on uh, verified sourcing areas, which is a multi-stakeholder uh, initiative uh, where IDH uh, takes a secretariat role. Um, and what we've um, been working on with ICL in, through this work is to try and systematically unpack um, the process from monitoring within a jurisdictional landscape approach to the actual process of making a claim. And uh, the document that ICL has prepared is an analytical framework and it gives a common taxonomy and with that a foundation for us to, uh, to expand on in the VSA uh, work. Um, and I think this document is primarily meant for uh, sustainability professionals such as ourselves, um, but the content that are it, within it, contained in it, have broader implications when we try to integrate that into um, company and public facing frameworks such as uh, verified sourcing areas. Um, so there's a couple of topics that we've already been discussing with ICO while uh, making this version of, of the guidance document. Um, and the first for us would be that uh, we need to ensure that the underlying basic principles and processes are clear and understandable by the relevant people on all sides. Um, the entry point is not only uh, what is the evidence that I need uh, within a jurisdictional landscape approach to be able to put a sustainability statement on a package or a product or in my sustainability report, uh, but it should also be about what if I'm a local government or a local actor in a jurisdiction, what do I need to do to convince the outside world that we are making um, credible progress. And so the guidance that we're putting forward should be understandable uh, for all these people that are involved. Um, and one of the points that speaks to the results of, of the poll just now is that uh, there is probably a balance between the rigor of the monitoring methods and the accessibility of it all to uh, set of local actors. Um, and for us, that last point is, is critical. We think that landscape and jurisdictional initiatives are at the core about uh, stimulating local action and local agency on improving sustainability. So uh, with this kind of guidance document, uh, we should enable uh, that kind of action and, and agency to, to start and to, to thrive while at the same time drawing the, the minimum requirements on what, it is, what, what is needed to make um, a claim. Um, and if we zoom out, uh, we feel that uh, we should make use of the full, the full potential of, of landscape approaches when it comes to um, connecting on real substantial topics um, that matter. And the word claim, and Patrick also alluded to that in the beginning, is probably not even a great fit for what we're trying uh, to do in this document. Um, because it's not that distant relationship between a company that's trying to, uh, that makes a generic statement on, on a package uh, saying this is uh, certified or this is sustainable. Uh, but what we can do with um, uh, landscape approaches is that we actually uh, try to come up with a, a common way of communicating about what we're doing and something that is shared and is consistent, coherent uh, about what the specific issues are 
um, in this particular supply chain in this particular region. So with that, uh, what we aim to do is to say that to help a company to say, we are re searching from uh, a certain region, there's a challenge in that uh, region, and it could be the reducing the, the use of agrochemicals. And this is how we're working with a broad set of local actors to improve the situation. And not only that, but also that the farmers and the governments on the other end of the chain on the production side can relate to what is being set on the market side and engage in that discussion that we're having. Um, so with that, we can also encourage two-way accountability. Um, so for us, this is a very important document and I would just like to encourage everybody to go through it very critically because we will be basing a lot of our work on, on what is basically uh, said in this document. So for us, it will be really essential to get your feedback. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Great, thank you, Guido. Uh, and uh, for another perspective on, uh, on the document and on how it might be relevant for one of the the leading initiatives and frameworks. I'm going to pass to, to Jeff Milder uh, from Rainforest Alliance. Jeff. Great. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, hello to everyone. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Landscale, it's an initiative to support stakeholders in driving sustainability improvements at landscape scale. And it does this by providing a structured system to assess and communicate about landscape sustainability. So. Um, stakeholders can use Landscale to um, track landscape performance in a systematic way. They can use it to assess the cumulative effects of landscape initiatives. Um, and in doing so, uh, it's intended to help drive incentives and decision making towards sustainability improvements on the ground. So claims are a key element of Landscale and we're currently in the midst of developing our claim system. So the ICO guidance is very welcome. It's very timely. And I'd just like to share a bit more about how um, our program is thinking about claims. So Patrick outlined three different kinds of claims and of those three, Landscale is most focused on performance claims. So these are claims that relate to actual on the ground conditions and trends in different outcome areas. In our case, those outcome areas are environment, human well-being, governance and productivity. And to make these kinds of performance claims credible, we believe that there's two main things that need to be in place. And as I mentioned these, you'll, um, you'll recognize the uh, different values in the last poll that came up. So first, there needs to be a structured way to measure sustainability performance. And this includes the appropriate selection of indicators, metrics, and data sources so that these follow good practice and are standardized where possible. But then they also need to allow for a certain amount of contextualization based on local circumstances and data availability. So that's the, the locally adapted approaches that was a popular um, option in the last poll. Um, so this need is met through the Landscale Assessment Framework, um, which we published in draft form last year. And we certainly um, welcome you to take a look at that. Um, second, there needs to be a verification process that reviews and validates the assessment results so that these results can be trusted as the basis for making claims. And Landscale is currently developing a verification mechanism to meet this need. Um, so we've been pilot testing the Landscale assessment framework in several countries. And um, through this process and also through consultations we've been having with companies and investors, we're learning quite a bit about the kinds of claims that users would like to make. And we're also learning quite a bit about data availability on the ground that might be able to inform these claims. So I wanna share a few examples. So the first kind of performance claim that we're hearing interest in is a status claim, um, which has to do with performance at a given point in time. So for instance, companies that are sourcing from our pilot landscape in Costa Rica believe that there is little or no problem with child labor and certain other human rights violations in that landscape. And they'd like to be able to demonstrate that through a status claim. A trend claim in contrast speaks to improvements over time. And in our Guatemala pilot, for instance, government agencies there have been leading restoration activities and they'd like to be able to communicate a positive trend line around key ecosystem variables so that they can attract more external investment to support this restoration work. A variation on the status or trend claim is to make a claim in relation to a specific target or threshold. For instance, again, in Costa Rica, um, the stakeholders there are interested in reporting progress against their carbon neutrality target. 
So the threshold is zero net emissions at a landscape level, and that's the claim they would like to make. And then finally, there is often interest in linking the status or trend binding to the role of specific actors. Um, and when that's done, then it becomes a contribution or an attribution claim where a given result is attributed in part or in whole to certain actors. And um, as Patrick alluded to, for companies that are making investments on the ground, um, this contribution or attribution claim is often of interest to them. So as you can tell, um, Landscale intends for claims to serve several different purposes. Um, we intend for them to help guide sourcing decisions, to attract or direct new investment, and also to allow um, stakeholders to demonstrate overall impacts at a landscape level. And in all cases, the goal is that claim making is the basis um, to strengthen incentives and catalyze greater action toward sustainability improvements. Um, as we're working on the verification and claims elements for land scale, um, we, we really believe it's to everyone's benefit if we can align our approaches um, from the get-go. So we're very pleased with the work ICL is doing. Um, we're uh, continuing to coordinate closely with ICL and with peer initiatives, um, such as verified sourcing areas and LTKL. And I also just want to mention in closing that later this year, we will be publicly consulting a full version of the land scale system, including the draft components on verification and claims. And we very much invite all of you to weigh in at that time. Um, you might also like to visit our website, landscale.org, and you can sign up for a newsletter so that you can hear about updates and opportunities to get involved. Thanks for the opportunity. Great, thank you, Jeff. And uh, two things. First, I, I mean, I think it's great how well coordinated a lot of our initiatives are. You know, there is a lot of uh, different work that's happening, but because we're so well connected, I do feel like there's a real opportunity for that alignment that Jeff talked about. Um, and, and secondly, um, just a very practical note, we will be circulating the PowerPoint and uh, recording to all the, partic all the um, yeah, participants. And so we'll include with that, I think, links to each of the initiatives who've been speaking today, just so you can find more information if you're, uh, if you're interested to dig in a little deeper. Um, and then from our side on the consultation, uh, our consultation on this draft guidance goes for another month until the 15th of July. Um, and you don't need to write down that, uh, that web address. It, uh, it'll be in the slides when you receive them. Um, so we're going to go now to Q&A. Uh, and there have been a number of questions that have come in. Um, I encourage all of you to continue to add questions. Um, we have just over 10 minutes left, so we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, we didn't talk through this a lot uh, in terms of who's going to respond to all of these. Um, so I'm going to uh, give it a first shot for a number of these questions and then uh, uh, see if anybody else wants to come in. So I'll probably answer a few questions and then open it up to the panelists. Uh, so first one, uh, and also if you go to the Q&A, you can actually upvote questions um, to see which ones we answer first. So to what extent does ISO guidance call for involvement of local communities in the governance process? Um, we don't get into that level of detail in this guidance document. It's a little bit higher level, much more um, recognizing the importance of multi-stakeholder governance processes involving key stakeholders of which local communities would obviously be one. Um, it doesn't speak a lot to the detail of how you encourage or incentivize local communities to participate and I think that has, as with sustainability standards, been an ongoing challenge to find the relevance. I do think the emphasis on locally grounded and built solutions is actually more promising for finding ways to engage local communities. Um, what challenges do you anticipate in being able to find monitoring data that meets the seven criteria for quality you mentioned? So if I can generalize this, imagine that if you haven't looked at the guidance yet, there are a, a number of these lists of here are all the criteria that would make for good quality something. In this case, good quality monitoring data. And it's almost like, you know, we don't yet know. In practice, what we're seeing, as I mentioned, is that jurisdictions or jurisdictional initiatives are looking for 
what are existing data sets. And often those are governmental data sets. And governmental data sets have an inherent legitimacy um, that they, uh, because they come from the government, they should be trusted or able to be trusted. The challenge is that we all know that often government data is not the best um, and not the most robust or transparent. Um, so it's kind of a, a tension as to whether we can get to um, data that fulfills all of those seven characteristics. So it's almost like with that list and other list, I, I would say at this point, they're aspirational. They're, you know, the good practice guidance isn't intended to be, you have to do all of these things, otherwise you're not credible, but rather here are all the things you need to think about to strengthen the quality and credibility of your system. And I should mention that ultimately, and this, I appreciate Guido and Jeff's interventions, because ultimately we're not so interested in having a standalone guidance as we are in building alignment within our community as to what are those good practices and how can they be manifest both in those frameworks like the SA and Landscale and in the jurisdictions themselves. Um, we're still struggling to make verifiable claims at a project level. So where does the confidence or aim come from to make claims at the landscape level? Really great question. So this is a reflection on sustainability standards working at a, a project level or an enterprise level or a production unit level. Um, and there are a lot of challenges still inherent in the credibility of the claims derived from sustainability standards. Um, and those sustainability standards are improving their practices, both their verification practices and the support and other strategies over time. But if you think about all the challenges inherent in verifying performance at a production unit level or project level, and you extrapolate that out to a landscape, suddenly you've multiplied exponentially the potential challenges involved. Um, but it's also important to recognize that you're verifying different things. So you're not necessarily verifying what exactly is happening at the production unit, but rather you're looking at data for performance at a landscape level. And so the interesting discussions that are currently happening are around what kinds of sustainability issues can be measured effectively at a landscape level. So if you look at deforestation and the use of geospatial data, you can actually be pretty confident in statements about levels of deforestation at a landscape level. So it's so in a way you're circumventing this extrapolation or this exponential growth of potential challenges. But other issues like uh, child labor or forced labor, uh, social issues in general, I think that the question still remains, to what extent is it feasible to have good quality data at a landscape level? Or is this about having good quality data at a enterprise level or a community level and extrapolating up. So that's, because that's such an interesting question, I do want to open it up to any of our speakers. Um, and also if you have thoughts about the other questions, maybe just really quick interventions so that we can get to another few comments before the top of the hour. And if you don't have anything to say, that's fine too. I can comment briefly on that one, Patrick. I think it's a, it's a really interesting question and it kind of poses a challenge to all of us. But I think it is also important to recognize some differences in the framing between the project intervention and what we're trying to achieve at a landscape level. And with a project intervention, the notion is you invest in certain activities and those activities have certain results. So you want to be able to show that causality, otherwise the investment didn't achieve what it set out to. Um, at a landscape level, it is more difficult to show that type of attribution, but it might also be less necessary because the whole notion of a multi-stakeholder landscape approach is that there's really complex issues that we're collaborating to address. And if we succeed in addressing those, um, you know, hopefully many people can claim some credit. We don't necessarily have to try as hard to figure out who deserves credit for what. So, 
in Landscale, you know, our initial focus is that we really want to understand status and trends, what's going on and how are things changing. And we're learning a lot about um, local, locally available data sets that can help with that. Um, and so I think if we take ourselves a little bit out of the project mindset, it opens up some more space for some innovative ideas that can furnish information um, to, to support sustainability improvements. Great, thank you, Jeff. And, and Guido, I saw you might wanna come in also. I'm just gonna throw in a question here that's directed at you and you can answer both of them at the same time. Um, it's quite specific, but it's basically about the status of verified sourcing areas. So are there any verified sourcing areas in Brazil or any jurisdiction? Is the concept, is it a concept for the future or for the present? And what happens if there's an increase in deforestation in an area that was stated as, VS, as a VSA, uh, considering deforestation is a dynamic process year on year. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe to start with that. So I, I think that the, the problem that's being um, described, a uh, problem of regression is something we're all uh, uh, dealing with. Uh, so what happens if, if progress is actually negative for the short term or for the longer term? Um, and I think the, um, the answer to that is that we're not uh, a verified sourcing area or any of our jurisdictional initiatives. The claim that we're making shouldn't be uh, only one direction. So it's about transparent communication about what's happening. And that means that things can also um, be delayed or temporarily uh, go the other way. Um, but what you can do is also communicate about the reasons why. And in some cases, those might actually not be directly uh, attributable to supply chain interventions. They may be caused by natural factors, for instance. Uh, so a richer communication than just uh, looking at uh, single KPIs uh, helps in that sense. And that's also when I say that uh, claims might be a bit too limited of a word. I think that the general transparent communication about what's happening in the landscape and who is contributing to that. Uh, to the first part of the question, um, we have readiness pilots in Brazil uh, because we are also finalizing our model uh, about, while testing it on the ground. Um, so in Cerezo, we have a um, readiness pilot and we have a couple of readiness pilots that you can also find um, on our website. Um, so we're testing it as we go. And I think that's the approach that many of us are taking, including um, Landscale. To the question that was uh, asked before, I think, uh, why, why should we do this at all? I think to me, uh, the most important answer to that is that we're trying to mobilize more support for landscape approaches and more recognition for landscape approaches. So it's some of the companies that we're working with say, OK, we are supporting projects. Uh, right now, this is something that I do as a sustainability manager. I know it's good, but I find it hard to communicate to my peers, to my managers, um, what this is and why this is important. And I think, again, it's not just a simple claim that says, okay, we're sourcing from this area, so it's sustainable. It's more that you have the tools as a sustainability manager in a company to talk to a broader set of stakeholders, which includes your in colleagues internally, but also your investors and your customers to say, this is what we're doing and this is how it's helping. Thanks, Patrick. Great, thanks. And we're almost at the top of the hour. We have a few questions that haven't been answered. I promise to answer those by email in follow-up to all the participants. Um, I do want to thank our panelists, uh, especially Jeff, Guido, and Rustika, uh, for sharing your experiences. And I want to pass it back to Petra and just thank uh, the whole Tropical Forest Alliance team for allowing us to be able to share our uh, experiences and, and make you all aware of the consultation. Um, so with that, thank you, and I'll just pass it back uh, to the team. Great, thanks so much, Patrick, and to all of the speakers and participants today. Um, I just wanted to very quickly note that the Jurisdictional Exchange Network, again, is an informal community of practice that brings all of you together. So if there's any content or updates or information that you want to bring to this broad audience, please do reach out to us uh, because this is a platform for TFA partners. And that brings us to the end of today's uh, meeting. As we said, we will be circulating the recording and the documents. And um, I hope that everyone felt this was a very useful hour. Thanks again to uh, participants and speakers and have a good rest of your day.